My name is Paul, and I'm one of the members here, and Peggy and I consider it a real privilege to belong to the City Light family, and I am very glad to have a chance to be with you this morning. John 11 is about Jesus and a man named Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, most of John's gospel centers on Jesus, who he is, what he said, what he did. But in addition to Jesus, there are three people whose names appear in the gospel of John more than any others. And those three people are the apostle Peter, John the Baptist, and Lazarus. Peter's name appears 35 times. John the Baptist's name appears 18 times. Lazarus' name appears 13 times, many times. So that makes today a pretty important day. Now, you may have missed it, but in verse 11, Jesus refers to Lazarus as our friend. He said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and awaken him. Now, men and women, friend is a pretty significant word in the Bible, because until now, only three individuals in the entire Bible were called God's friend, and those three were Abraham and Job and Moses. So it was a special word that represented a special relationship. But in the final chapters, here's what I want you to know. In the final chapters of the Gospel of John, Jesus stops calling the disciples his servants and begins calling them his friends. A clear sign that Jesus was drawing closer to his disciples, and today Jesus wants to draw, draw closer to you and me. And to help us understand, understand that and to move us toward that end, I have discovered three things that we can confidently believe when Jesus is your friend. First, when Jesus is your friend, he's never too late. In the opening verses of John 11, two things stand out. Number one, Lazarus, a man Jesus loved, was very sick. And number two, upon learning of his condition, Jesus did not immediately respond. Now put yourself in Mary and Martha's sandals for just a moment. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus, and, and they specifically asked Jesus to come and help him. Furthermore, they knew that, hey, if he could open the eyes of the blind, there's going to be no problem being able to heal their brother Lazarus. Nevertheless, it is striking that Jesus was in no hurry to get there. In addition to waiting two days, when he finally revealed that Lazarus was dead, he actually said, you know, guys, for your sake, I'm actually glad I wasn't there because there's something I want you to believe. Now, since we know the end of the story, we are fully aware that Jesus knew what he was doing, but Mary and Martha didn't know. Mary and Martha were totally confused because what they thought was going to happen is not what happened. Now, I have always had a cell phone, but for many years, I had an old flip phone that had no texting in it. And over time, people got on me about this. And the truth is, I was never very motivated to change, partly because my old flip phone was the kind our Lord used. <laughs> and secondly, I just didn't see the need. Well, then one Sunday at City Light, Gavin, our lead pastor, preached a sermon about cell phones. And he said God made cell phones for one purpose, and that purpose was for texting people. Do you remember that sermon? I don't remember anything else about that sermon. <laughs> but Gavin said the reason God made cell phones had nothing to do with talking to people, not to do with calling people. It had to do with texting people. That is the reason God made cell phones. So with this new revelation that I had received that morning, I went out and I purchased my first cell phone with texting. And of course, two of the people that I wanted to text right away were Gavin and Chris. So when I texted Chris, his reply was super positive and super encouraging. Paul, great job, way to go, hashtag total win, hashtag so much fun. <laughs> uh, 
I loved that. I, I, that. That was great. Then I texted Gavin, and his reply was, ladies and gentlemen, hell has now frozen over. <laughs> so I texted back, I thought you would be happy for me. He texted, welcome to 2002. Not what I thought would happen. <laughs> Being two days late is not what Mary and Martha thought would happen. In fact, they both said, Lord, if you'd been here, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died, but you were late, and now it's too late. Now, what were these women forgetting, really? What were these women forgetting? The answer is God's divine providence. Mary and Mar Martha thought he was late, but Jesus thought he was right on time. Mary and Martha saw an urgent need, but Jesus saw a providential moment. To Jesus, Lazarus' illness was more than an illness. It was providential. And the Gospel of John records numerous such encounters. Nathaniel in John 1, the woman at the well in John 4, the man born blind in John 9, Peter before he denied Jesus in John 13, Peter after the resurrection in John 21, and of course, Lazarus here in John 11, just to name a few. Men and women, even though Mary and Martha didn't understand what was happening, Jesus wasn't in a hurry because he knew that through Lazarus' illness, many people would see the power of God and believe in him. Now, this story reminds us that we are living our lives in someone else's universe. And specifically, it reminds us that the same God who is behind Lazarus' illness is behind what's happening in your life, too. Alan Redpath, the renowned British evangelist, wrote, There is no circumstance, no trouble, no testing, that can ever touch me until, first of all, it has gone past God and past Christ right through to me. If it has come that far, it has come with a great purpose, which I may not understand at the moment. We're living our lives in someone else's universe and providentially mixed in with his friendship is his lordship. My father's way may twist and turn, my heart may throg, throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray, my hopes may fade away, but still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for he doth know the way. Though night be dark and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith my all in him, he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see. My eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by, the mist will lift. And plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. When Jesus is your friend, he always knows what he's doing. And he's never too late. And we all desperately need a friend like that. Second, when Jesus is your friend, you never weep alone. Everyone has a breaking point, And when Lazarus died, Mary and Martha found theirs. The disappointment from Jesus not being there, coupled with the sadness of their brother's death, left them feeling overwhelmed, and the natural response was their tears. So they wept, and then their friends wept, and two times the text says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit, and then Jesus wept. Now, while death is arguably the ultimate loss, we all know that there's other kinds of loss and sadness, don't we? There's a loss of a dream, loss of a friendship, loss of a marriage, loss of a job, loss of a job offer, 
loss of a house. There's the sadness when someone loses their reputation or loses their health or their savings or their business. To be sure, there are some days that'll just feel, they're just filled with tears. And we may weep, but when we weep, we don't weep alone. Because when Jesus is your friend, you never weep alone. Now, the simple reason Jesus' tears are so powerful is that Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. This is nothing new to him. That means that Jesus can identify at the heart level with the sorrows of others. He relates to feeling hurt because he was wounded. He relates to feeling left out because he was rejected. He relates to feeling oppressed because he was crushed. Trust me, not only did Jesus understand how Mary and Martha felt, he understands how you and I feel today. And I desperately want you to convince you of that this morning because I don't really believe that the majority of us came into this room this morning actually believing that heart and soul that whatever I'm feeling, Jesus is actually feeling. That, uh, that, that whatever I'm going through, Jesus understands. And I'm trying to convince you that whatever you're in the middle of, whatever you're feeling, whatever is making you cry, whatever is keeping you up at night, whatever is breaking your heart, whatever is depressing you, whatever is discouraging you, whatever is confusing you, what I'm saying to you is that even though no one else knows how you feel, Jesus knows how you feel. Because when Jesus is your friend, you may weep, but you don't weep alone. He knows, and he feels it. And Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible was put in the Bible for you and me this morning. Peggy and I have two daughters who do not live nearby. And so we can identify with parents whose children live far away. In fact, several years ago, at the very same time, Carrie lived in Africa and Crystal lived in China. We're still not sure exactly how that happened because the truth is Peggy just wanted God to send me somewhere. <laughs> but in our family, in our family, we know by experience what it feels like to say goodbye at the airport. And so does Jesus, who bears our griefs and carries our sorrows. A.B. Simpson used to tell the story about a mother who sent her son to an English boarding school. It was very far from her home. But later, she was very troubled when she found out that the school would only permit her to visit her son once every two weeks. Well, this is more than she could bear. So unknown to her son and unknown to the school and unknown to her teachers, she rented a little attic apartment overlooking the school. And while her son never knew, she would sit in the upper room with her eyes on her little boy as he played in the schoolyard and studied in the classroom. He could not see her. But if he got hurt or cried or called her name, or needed her for a moment. She was within his reach, and he was never really alone. So in the words of the famous gospel hymn that was written in 1905 and later was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2010, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion... My constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. My friends, when Jesus is your friend, he knows what you're feeling, and we may weep, but we never weep alone. And finally, when Jesus is your friend, there's hope. There's hope for any situation. If a car can run out of gas, a person can run out of hope. And that's what happened to Mary and Martha. Let me paraphrase. Martha said, Lord, he died four days ago. So to be blunt, there's no hope. Jesus said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's still hope. Your brother's going to rise again. And Martha said, well, yeah, of course, he's going to rise again at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said, wait a minute, the resurrection is not a day, it's me. 
I'm the resurrection and the life. Just because he's dead doesn't mean there's no hope. And hey, I'll prove it. Just watch. Jesus said, well, where have you laid him? So they showed him. And then Jesus said, okay, you guys take away the stone. And Martha said, Lord, this is not a good idea for many reasons. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you just believe. You're going to see the power of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus prayed. And then by name, Jesus called Lazarus to come out. And those who were there and saw it believed in Jesus. So there were actually two miracles on that day. A dead man was made alive. God raised Lazarus from the dead. And unbelievers were converted. God gave eternal life to those who were there and believed. Raised the physically dead and raised the spiritually dead all in the same moment. One of the most moving stories I've ever read is this story in a book called Fresh Power by Pastor Jim Cimbala. He tells the story of David Berkowitz, the infamous son of Sam from the New York City murders in 1977. In 1953, Berkowitz was adopted by practicing Jewish parents, and as a result, he knew virtually nothing about Jesus. As a young adult, his crimes began as random acts of violence. He tossed big rocks off overpasses into traffic. He set 2,000 fires, which he logged in a journal. He got involved in a satanic cult, and he prayed to demons to guide his murders. After his arrest, he pleaded guilty to killing five women, one man, wounding many others, and he was sentenced to over 300 years in prison. In 1979, an inmate slit his throat, and the doctors couldn't even explain how he even lived. Eight years later, he was moved to the Sullivan Correctional Facility, and there an inmate named Ricky Lopez approached him and said, David, Jesus still loves you and has a purpose for your life. Berkowitz laughed and said, you don't know who you're talking to. There is no hope for me. Jesus still loves me, and there's a purpose for my life. You don't know who you're talking to. There's no hope for me. No one could love someone who had committed such horrible crimes. But Rick, Ricky gave him a Bible and suggested that he start with the book of Psalms. And David's turning point came when he read Psalm 118, verse 5, which says, Out of my distress I called to the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Soon after, David knelt by his bunk and asked Jesus to be his Savior. And today, Berkowitz is not only a follower of Jesus, he is the chaplain at the Sullivan Correctional Facility. Symbola writes, David has now spent half his life behind bars. He will never be paroled. In fact, he has never asked me or any other minister to plead for his release. He knows that his crimes were so serious and that he deserves to be locked up for life. And he says the prison is his God-ordained sphere of ministry now. To leave this setting, he says, would be to run from the call of God on his life. There's plenty to do here. My friends, if God can turn a murderer into a chaplain, there's hope. There's hope for me. There's hope for you. There's hope for us. Now, in closing... Let me ask you this question. How many people thought, really now, how many people thought Berkowitz would become a follower of Jesus? How many people really thought it was possible for a man who repeatedly destroyed property, set fires, prayed to demons, and murdered people to end up serving God as a prison chaplain? How many people? Well, I'll tell you how many. The same number of people who thought Lazarus could be made alive. The same number of people who thought it was possible for a man who had been dead for four days to hear his name and walk out of a tomb. The same number. Nobody. Now, I don't mean any disrespect, but I've been to funerals, and so have you. And I've stood right next to the coffin and talked with the family. And so have you. And I know that the dead person could not hear my voice. 
But men and women, the voice that Lazarus heard from the grave was another voice. And the voice that David Berkowitz heard in prison was another voice. It was the voice of Jesus, and it's his voice that is speaking to us right now. So it doesn't matter if you can hear my voice. What matters is, can you hear his voice? His voice is saying there's hope. His voice is saying there's hope. He can do anything. There's hope because he can raise the physically dead and the spiritually dead. There's hope because he can love any sinner and pardon any sin. He can mend any relationship. He can save any marriage. He can heal any illness and break any addiction. There's hope because he can give hope to the hopeless. Can you hear his voice? I'm telling you, he's not talking to Berkowitz. Not now. He's not talking to Lazarus this morning. He's talking to you and me. I'm asking you, can you hear his voice this morning? In the ears of your heart, in the deepest part of your soul, what is he saying to you? He's not talking to those guys. And it's not my voice that I want you to hear. What is Jesus saying? Can you hear his voice? He's saying there's hope. There's hope for any situation. Now it's time to do business with God. You and me. All of us together. It's not a time to learn more information. It's not a time to hear more stories. It's time to do business with God. Now, I don't think I'm here this morning by accident. And I don't think you're here this morning by accident. I believe that we're all here today for a reason. A divine appointment. A providential moment. Because you know in your heart what God's voice has been saying to you this morning. You know what you're going through. You know where you're confused. You know where you feel lonely. You know where you're discouraged. You know. And the good news this morning is that so does Jesus. And he's the one that initiated this appointment. You're not here by accident. It's Jesus himself who wants to have a little visit with you and me. He's the one who's drawing us closer to himself this morning. So I'm asking you to open your heart and listen to his voice. I'm asking you to draw near to him as he draws near to you. I'm asking you to surrender your intellect and surrender your emotions and surrender your will. I'm asking you to trust Jesus as your friend and your Lord and your only hope. Now we've got time We've got time. We're not in a hurry. And for the next 60 seconds, we're not going to make any sound. There's not going to be any music. No moving around. We're just going to all be still. And we're going to do business with God. It's an appointment he's been waiting to have with each of us. So I'm asking you now, You listen for his voice. Let's quietly bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we believe that you are our Savior and our friend. We believe that you know what we're going through. We believe that you're behind everything that's happening in our lives. We believe that you understand how we feel. We believe that you are our only hope. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for initiating this time with you. Thank you for calling our name. 
for reaching out to us in love. We hear your voice, Lord, this morning. We're coming. Thank you for drawing near to us. We are now drawing near to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.